engaging the community since 1970. This is WIS Awareness. Good morning and thanks for joining us for Awareness Today. I'm your host, Leland Pender. This morning, I'm joined by the new president and CEO of the Carolina Center for Hospice in Columbia. And of course, given their name, they deal with people and their medical needs and end-of-life care. And right now, TCC is in the midst of a historic transition. And with more on that, I'm joined by the new president and CEO, Mariset Hassan. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Leland, for having me. Absolutely. Tell us more about what's happening right now that is so historic about this transition. Oh, wow. Um, the, the Carolina Center for Hospice and End-of-Life Care is a two-state uh, trade association, and we work primarily with um, hospice and palliative care organizations in North and South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And up to about three and a half years ago, um, I was on the provider side working as an administrator with uh, local hospice programs in, in our community. Uh, started my career uh, working at Palmetto Baptist on the cancer unit as a cancer nurse and quickly uh, after about four years decided I wanted to transition into hospice mm -hmm. and have certainly in a 37 year uh, nursing career have certainly um, seen my share of not only hospice patients and families, but also dealing with um, wonderful physicians, um, community workers, etc. So about three and a half years ago, I had an opportunity. I'd always worked with this organization on the provider side because I was a member of the Carolina Center, our organizations were. And about three and a half years ago, they brought me on board to be the VP for operations for South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So my focus up until recently was just primarily working with South Carolina providers, uh, regulators, uh, stakeholders, uh, many organizations who kind of work with patients um, similar to what we are doing uh, with our organizations. And uh, we had a leadership transition in the fall. We are 41 years old. And uh, at the time, uh, the, the board asked me to be, serve as the interim. And I said, okay, yeah, I'm happy to do that. And so, which meant I would be overseeing both states. Uh, and then uh, after they did um, some due diligence and uh, checked out what they felt they needed in a, in a CEO, if, after talking with our stakeholders and uh, polling our members, um, they came up with a profile and said, Marcet, you meet the profile. We don't need to look anywhere else. And so, You're already in house. Ah, we're already in house. <laughs> and so, um, not quite two months into my uh, president CEO role, but um, but very humbled and honored to to be at the helm. One thing that's unique about our industry is that there are not a lot of African Americans who serve in senior executive leadership roles in hospice. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for me to have uh, through my career to have moved up to serve as an administrator and help to start hospices was certainly um, a wonderful opportunity for me. But to be at the helm of this organization as the first nurse and also the first African-American was something special. So. Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, quite an accomplishment. And to be you know, recognized after more than 40 years, it's great to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw some pictures here uh, going across the screen a few minutes or a few seconds ago. Your church had a big party for you. They celebrated you. Yeah. And they were so happy for you. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about these pictures here. Uh, well, um, these are my pastors, um, Pedro and Maria Maldonado, the, the former picture that you saw. We, they are uh, pastors of Chosen to Conquer International Ministries here in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, they've been my pastors since I was in my early 20s. I hate to tell you how old I am now, but uh, <laughs> this is my husband and my brother. And um, I had no idea they were doing this. And so they have been with me in this church um, uh, for many years years since I graduated from Carolina and uh, have seen me develop as a nurse and there'd be nights when I'd be out you know two or three in the morning taking care of patients you know and their families uh, when I was on the uh, the side of providing direct care and uh, there was always prayer support from my leaders and uh, very special ministry to me and uh, Leo if you don't have a church you need to come check us out sometime <laughs> okay but we'll uh, talk later about that <laughs> um, but anyway these are pictures of, of family and, and friends uh, that gathered to to uh, celebrate my accomplishments that's so. that's really great to see you have the support from your community. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about your uh, your goals and what you want to accomplish in your role as officially being president now. You kind of were in the job in the interim yeah. period, but now it's your job. Yeah. What do you want to accomplish? Well, one of the things that we want to do is we want to get people to see that hospice doesn't have to be a scary word. You know, that's the first thing, you know, uh, first of all, you know, when we hear the word cancer, we think, okay, I'm, I'm getting ready to die. And then when you say, well, we're going to make a 
referral to hospice, they automatically, people are, are fearful and not seeing that there are transitions in uh, chronic illness. And so there are times when palliative care, which is further upstream and people are still getting treatment, but they're getting symptoms managed, um, that that's appropriate. But there's also times when treatment's not working, that what we want to do is to come alongside families and patients and provide that support at home through trained um, uh, professionals who come into the home to provide that support. So that's one thing. The other thing that we're really about is we've gotten two large grants recently where uh, in North Carolina we're creating an online platform where people can upload their health care information and things like health care power of attorneys, you know, those advanced care planning documents. In South Carolina, we just kicked off a huge, um, we're about to launch a huge uh, initiative, advanced care planning initiative that really is going to focus on um, minority, underserved, rural populations and helping our families initiate conversations that are tough. We don't like to talk about what's going to happen when I can no longer direct my care. We, we're going to talk about what vacations we're going to go on. Uh, we're going to talk about how we're going to get our hair done, Leland. Uh, we're going to talk about a good restaurant. Mm -hmm. But we just, in our, in our communities, we just don't want to talk about, okay, now if I can't speak anymore, who's going to be in charge for me? Mm -hmm. What would I want that care to look like? Would I want to be at home? Or would I want to be in a nursing home? Mm -hmm. What would I want my family to do? And so we're kicking off an initiative where we're going to hopefully encourage people to normalize having these kinds of conversations. That when we go to the family reunion, we not only catch up on some of the good, hot, juicy gossip that's happened in the family, <laughs> but we also talk about, okay, do you have your health care power attorney in, in, in line? Mm -hmm. If you put that stuff together, you know, let's talk about that. Let's not only talk about it, but let's put it in a document so that when the time comes, and we're in a medical crisis, our um, physicians will know what to do. And our families won't have to panic because mm -hmm. we've already told them what we want. You know, that's, so those are two big things that we're working on. And those are hard conversations to have. And like you've already just said, a lot of folks just are hesitant to do so. Mm -hmm. But it's important and has to be done. It, it, it really does. I, um, my mother uh, died about 28 years ago. And she really epitomized a woman who loved to talk about these tough issues. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was uh, a young nurse in my 20s. And, um, you know, my mom, I felt like at age 50, was dying way too young. Now that I'm on the other side of 50, I know that that was way too young. Yeah. <laughs> but um, she really told me what she wanted. And I didn't want to hear it, but she made us listen. She said, these are the things. I, you know, I don't want you putting all the money in the ground. I want you to take care of my sisters. Um, you know, uh, take care of my, my daughters. And so it is important to have those conversations. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hassan, for coming in. So great to have you. You gave me a new title. Oh, oh sorry, Mrs. Hassan. gosh, I need to get that salary. <laughs> well, well, I hope you can. I'm rooting for you, All right. as are so many other people out in the community. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it, Leland. No problem. All right. Coming up next on Awareness Celebrating Women's History Month, we're taking a look at African American women during the Civil War era and their impact on history. It's only a matter of time until your check engine light comes on, or worse yet, your car needs repair. That could mean a big surprise auto repair bill. Those repairs are more expensive than ever. A new engine can be over $5,000. A new transmission over $4,000. That's why it's so important you call CarShield today. CarShield is the number one auto protection company in the country. I like CarShield because they were reliable, affordable, and they were trustworthy. Well, I think everybody should have car shield. Once your manufacturer's warranty is expired, there's just no big bills. If we needed repairs, car shield was there for us. Now it's your turn to get the peace of mind that comes with having car shield so you can worry less about auto repairs. Call or go online right now to get car shield for yourself. Friendly, knowledgeable, money saving representatives are available 24 hours a day. So if your car is 20 years old or newer, just tell us the make and model of your car or truck to get an instant plan quote. In a matter of minutes, you can be covered. I was elated that I had car shield. I was more than happy. There's no fun when you have a car and it's broken and you can't pay for it to get it fixed. Here's how CarShield works. When your car needs repair, you take it to your favorite mechanic or even your dealer, and CarShield gets them paid directly. That's why CarShield is America's number one auto protection provider. CarShield is just the best thing to take away the fear that when something is going to go wrong with your car, because it will, and CarShield is going to be there to back you up. My experience with CarShield 
is that they absolutely come through every time I need them. If my car breaks down, I can count on CarShield to cover it for me. CarShield definitely has my back. Now it's the time to make the smart choice and protect yourself from sky-high auto repair bills. Call now for a free and instant protection plan quote. It's only a matter of time until repairs are needed. And once your car breaks down, it's too late. Call 1-800-440-7215. That's 1-800-440-7215. Welcome back this morning to Awareness, and right now I'm joined by my next guest today. This is Janie Harriet. She is the executive director of the South Carolina African American Heritage Fund. Thank you for being here. Foundation. Foundation, excuse me. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, And right now, though, you all have a great uh, thing going on. A group of women uh, reenacting Civil War times. They're African American women doing this, and they're crisscrossing the state, putting on performances. Tell us more about what going on? Well, they're called Freed. It's female reenactors of distinction. And they are telling stories of African American women during the Civil War, which we don't hear a lot about. Mm -hmm. Uh, We hear about, you know, the men who are doing the reenacting, and we hear a lot about the flag, of course, and we hear a lot about other things, but we don't hear about what were women doing during the um, Civil War? So these women are from Washington, D.C. They're affiliated with the African American Civil War Museum in Washington, D.C. And I was up there a few years ago and I spoke at the museum, and then I heard about them and I thought, they would be great for South Carolina. So we're bringing them to South Carolina. And you guys, you're, you've been to Clemson, uh, going to Rock Hill, Columbia, of course, uh, all over the state. Absolutely. Um, the African American Heritage Commission has members from all over the state. And when we bring people to the, uh, these kinds of performances to the state, we usually like to spread it around. So they were in Clemson on Thursday evening, Columbia on Friday, Rock Hill on Saturday, and Hartsville on Sunday. And let's pop up those details real quickly, if we can, of that performance in Hartsville coming up today. Tell us about what we're seeing. Everything from the, we'll start with how they're dressed. Normally, that's not the depiction you see of African American women during that era. Right, and I don't know why they picked these particular uh, costumes, but they picked them, I think, based on the characters because some of the characters are real, but some of them, I understand, the women created themselves okay. to tell the stories. So these are their costumes, and it will be at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, this afternoon, mm-hmm. um, at the Center Theater, and that's at 212 North 5th Street in Hartsville. All right, so let's. Uh, you mentioned some of the characters are based on real people, some are not. One of those characters based on a real person is um, Hallie Quinn Brown, who was the president of Allen University here in Columbia. Dean. The dean. The dean of of Allen University, right. She served at Allen University Mm -hmm. after the Civil War. So um, the person who portrays her is Patricia Tyson, Mm -hmm. who is kind of the coordinator of the group. And as it turns out, she has a nephew that lives here in South Carolina as well. So we are happy to bring her to South Carolina to see where Miss Brown might have worked. And we're going to arrange for a tour of the campus for them. And so it's important to us that these stories are told because it's important that our children understand what these stories meant to the evolution of who they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tell us in your own words why we don't know more about these women. We know of uh, uh, Harriet Tubman and um, you know other figures like that and not to take anything away from them. Right. But for instance, Hallie Quinn Brown, that's a name you don't hear a whole lot. And I never heard of it until I saw these women. Mm -hmm. So The thing is that our history is not necessarily in a book. Mm -hmm. Um, And in South Carolina, we do a poor job of of even teaching African-American history, which is something I'll talk about in a few minutes as Mm -hmm. well. So that is why we don't know these stories. So the important thing for our commission, and we we were founded 
to preserve the history of African Americans in South Carolina. It's important to us to tell these stories, and that's why it's been my job for the last 10 or 15 years to find these stories, to bring these stories to our children, because these performances are really geared for young people. And is this the only um, week you have the reenactors coming to South Carolina? Is it over a couple of weeks? or? No. It's just this just week. This week, okay. Yes, yes. So hopefully you've been able to get out and see one of these performances at different parts of the state. But again, mm -hmm. there's one today in Hartsville, in Hartsville. at uh, 3 o'clock. And you mentioned South Carolina has uh, done sometimes a poor job of telling African-American stories and history. And that's something that you and the folks you work with work to do better at and make right. Exactly. So we'll discuss some of that here coming up after the break as awareness continues with Janie Harriet, Executive Director of the South Carolina African-American Heritage Foundation. Do you use catheters? Are you using the catheter that's really best for you? Oh, yeah. For years, I'd been using one kind of catheter, and I never knew that there were other really great catheters available until Liberator sent me samples to try. If I had not tried the samples from Liberator, I might never have found the perfect catheter for me. Liberator Medical sent me a catheter that was easier for me to use right out of the package. I even use them in my airplane and carry four or five and can be gone for a whole day. And now that I've found the best catheter for me, it's made my life much easier. There are so many innovative catheters. Get the best catheter for you. Call Liberator Medical, a CR Bard company. Get your free catheter sample pack. Call 1-800-437-7555. 1-800-437-7555. There is a place closer than you think where businesses, restaurants, schools, and families thrive. That place is Forest Acres. With dozens of retail shops, dining options of every description, schools, parks, and entertainment, in Forest Acres, you can eat, shop, and play in a safe, welcoming, family-friendly setting. Rediscover the enjoyment of shopping, dining, and living. Discover Forest Acres. Welcome back this morning here on WIS Awareness, joined by uh, Janie Harriet, director of the South Carolina African American Heritage Foundation. And if you go to their website, I believe it's scaaheritagefound.org. That's right. You will see right there on the homepage a quote. And let me read it to you here. It's from the uh, Governor's Task Force on Historic Preservation from the year 2000. It says African American history is culturally rich and important to our state. We need to do a better job of recognizing this. The mixing of the two cultures made our state what it is. So, Jenny, tell us more about that. If you can recall, who said that? Who is it was Jim Hodge. Well, actually, it was from um, Governor Jim Hodge. Former governor. Yeah, okay. because he created the task force mm -hmm. that, that created this study. But what we found... Um, I guess in 1993, I when attended, we first got started. When we first got started, mm -hmm. there was almost nothing being done in the state to preserve African American history and mm -hmm. culture. And as an educated woman and an educator, I had never heard of the Department of Archives and History. Just to give you a, a glimpse of what we we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So we met, a group of us met, and decided that there needed to be some attention paid to the history of African Americans in South Carolina, since it is so rich. Mm -hmm. And so we um, lobbied the General Assembly, and they created at that time the South Carolina African American Heritage Council. And then Governor Hodges issued an executive order during his tenure creating the African American Heritage Commission. You mentioned how rich the culture is. If you, um, you know, look up or study African American history, most African Americans have origins here in South Carolina, the large majority of them. And so at that time, you know, being tasked with being on this commission, where do you even start? Because so much had to be done. You were kind of starting from scratch almost. 
Absolutely. And when we started, I'm not a historian. I'm a business major. Mm -hmm. But the reason that I was part of this group is because I was working to save my high school over in Hartsville. And so I didn't know where to start, but there were all these historians on, who were appointed that had ideas about where to start. Mm -hmm. And so what we decided to do is that there should be a listing of African-American historic sites in South Carolina. And so that was the first thing we did. Mm -hmm. We decided to list everything that had a South Carolina historical marker or was listed on the National Register. And just to give you an example of how little was being done, mm -hmm. the South Carolina Historical Marker Pro Program was started in 1936. In 1993, there were only 36 sites recognized. Wow. So that's where we start. Today, there are more than 350. Wow, so much to be discovered and uncovered out there. That's amazing. Yes. So now tell me, over these last uh, almost 30 years, 25 years or so, since the commission and the foundation have been in place, how have you been able to better tell these stories and represent African Americans in our state? Well, of course, we've listed the places and we, have, we do a publication yearly of the African American historic sites in South Carolina. Then we took that book, because it is a publication, and we created lesson plans for teachers in classrooms. So we have a, a book that's called A Teacher's Guide to African American Historic Places in South Carolina. And it takes all 300 sites and creates a lesson plan that is available to teachers on the website mm -hmm. at the Department of Education, at our website, and on the Department of Archives and History website. And that one was created in 2008 and then updated in 2015 for social studies. Then in 2016, we took the same guide and created lesson plans for the arts. And aside from creating the lesson plans, what we do is provide opportunities for artists to go into the classrooms based on the lesson plans and the historical sites and interact with the students and artist residencies. And talk about, I guess, the, uh, the reception or how, how has it been going? <laughs> Listen, we don't have enough money to uh -huh. go all the places that we that we are requested. Mm -hmm. We're in the process now of upgrading, updating the arts curriculum guide, the teacher's guide, mm -hmm. to the current standards because all of our lesson plans are geared to the K through 12 curriculum standards mm -hmm. in South Carolina. So we're in the process of doing that. We're going to be doing a teacher institute because we also provide training for the teachers on how to use the guide. Mm -hmm. So this summer we'll be providing a teacher institute for about 20 teachers to come and learn about the sites and create additional lesson plans. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's not enough money to go around. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we've done, we've created what we call the Green Book of South Carolina. Tell us about that real quickly. The Green Book of South Carolina mm -hmm. is a listing mm -hmm. of 350 African American historic sites mm -hmm. in South Carolina. It is web-based, www.greenbookofsc.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so... What we've done in this guide is we've listed the sites, we've told you about the sites, why they're historic, and why you should visit them. That's amazing, and it's really easily accessible. Easy, it's all online. www.greenbookofsc.com. Yeah. Okay, so now, if there's a principal or a teacher or even a, a school system, a superintendent that wants to reach out to you to learn more about what you offer, how can they do that? They can call me at 843 three three two three five eight nine or email S C A A Heritage Found at gmail dot com. Okay, and again the website the same S C A A Heritage Found dot org. org. That's right. All right. So glad to have you in this morning. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Thank you. Enjoyed the conversation. Hope you all did too. We'll see you back here in a few minutes on awareness.
Attention parents of children diagnosed with cerebral palsy, Herb's palsy, or another birth injury. If you suspect a medical mistake may have occurred at or near the time of birth, your child may have important legal rights. Call Science and Kirk for a free legal consultation. Cerebral palsy is a permanent disability that may be the result of brain damage suffered during pregnancy, delivery, or shortly after birth. A failure to follow the proper standard of care may be the cause of your child's injury. A lifetime of medical treatment can cost millions of dollars. Protect your family and find out whether financial compensation may be available. Cases are also being investigated for children diagnosed with Herb's palsy, also known as shoulder dystocia or brachial plexus injury. If you suspect your child's disability could have been prevented, obtain a free consultation and case evaluation. Call 1-800-313-6180 for a free consultation. Ever since we moved into our new Munga home, life's just so comfortable. Big bedrooms and closets. That cat's around here somewhere. Look at this kitchen. Smells good, Mom. It's got a great garage. I bet I could park this thing. Our favorite music with a touch of a button. Fenced backyard to grill out with friends and squirrel. What else can anyone wish for? Built by our family. Designed for yours. Visit a Mungo model home today. Come on, kid. Where's the cat? Before we let you go this morning, I just learned some really cool information here. Uh, Miss Janie Harriet here. Between your eight siblings, and that would be all of your and their kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids, you have 167 nieces and nephews. Yes. We wow. rearrange restaurants when we go. <laughs> <laughs> and family reunions are probably just off the charts, I would imagine. Well, you know, the thing is, we do a family reunion both on my mother's side and my father's side, mm -hmm. which are also huge families. So we have as many as three sometimes 350 people at family reunions. Wow, that is unreal. And yes. you're all from, Hart started in Hartsville. No. That's where it started. Oh. Uh, my family is originally from Lee County. Lee County, okay. My, my, my father and mother moved to Hartsville, but we are originally from Lee County. I think you guys need your own commission or foundation and to I learn about. Yeah, because yeah. I, I was actually born in North Carolina. What part? Wilmington. I lived in Wilmington for a good bit. Yeah, I graduated from Fayetteville State. Very cool. Okay, yeah. we're going to go ahead and become friends after the show. We have a lot to talk about, apparently. <laughs> yeah. But again, thanks for being here today, and so glad you were here, too. Thank Ms. you Harriet. for having me. And have a great rest of your morning, and uh, see you back here next week.